Our next speaker is Nisha Goldsworthy. Nisha, can you please share your screen and turn on your microphone and camera? Nisha is from James Cook University and her talk is on coral reef fishes of the genus Trema, distribution, life history and diet. Thank you so much, Nisha. Uh, thank you, Alana. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the forgotten fishes of the genus Trema. So our understanding of coral reefs is like a jigsaw puzzle. There are so many missing pieces. And ecologists are continuously trying to fill in these missing pieces to gain more knowledge and understanding to help us see the overall bigger picture. However, our understanding isn't necessarily as random like this picture shows and actually looks a bit more like this. And this is because we know so many things about certain subjects and we know very little about others. And this is actually particularly evident uh, in our understanding of coral reef fishes, where most research focuses on the more visually prominent reef fishes. And in consequence, the small cryptic reef fishes are poorly understood because they're actually really poorly studied. Uh, so why is, do we see this research bias? Why do the larger, more visually prominent fishes take priority? Well, firstly, the small cryptic reef fishes are very difficult to research. Uh, I mean, they're designed to be small and invisible. Uh, and secondly, they have this thing called low standing biomass, which means their biomass on the reef at any time is actually really low. And in studies, this often leads to the assumption that they are actually ecologically insignificant. However, this just isn't really true. In fact, these forgotten fishes show extreme diversity and abundance, and they actually have really important ecological roles. So the genus Trimmer is actually a prime example of a forgotten fish. Now these Indo-Pacific pygmy gobies are incredibly diverse. There are over 105 species in this genus. And, and as you can see by the photos, they, they're really diverse. There are so many of them. And um, genetic analysis predicts there could be close to 200 species, which would make them one of the most diverse genus of coral reef fish. And because of their size, they're actually really, really small. They have a maximum standard length of less than three centimeters. And it's because of their size and their cryptic nature that they're really understudied. And there's very little known about even their basic ecology, such as their distribution, their life histories, and their diets. So why is it important to understand their distribution? Well, their distribution is thought to be controlled by abiotic factors on the reef, such as depth, location, and reef slope but it could also be controlled by biotic factors, such as microhabitat partitioning. And small gobies are actually shown to partition their microhabitats on a really fine scale. So this could actually be an explanation for why we can see such incredible diversity, how so many species can coexist in one area at the same time. And next for their life history. And like I said before, they have really low standing biomass However, they could have short lifespans, rapid linear growth, which could lead to a fast population turnover. And this in combination with their extreme mortality and high abundances could actually lead to high productivity over time. And in turn, they could actually be really important in coral reef energy flow. And speaking of energy, their diets. So cryptobenthic gobies are actually shown to exploit a really wide range of um, of prey species. And this can range from um, anything from detritus to zooplankton. So they exploit like pretty much every sort of food you can think of. And we don't really know much about the feeding habits of trimmer. They could be uh, eating from the benthos. So they could be recycling nutrients that's produced locally on the reef, or they could actually be feeding from the pelagic envi environment. <clears throat> so importing nutrients and energy onto the reef system by plankton that's brought in by ocean currents. Uh, so that leads to the aims. So that's why I really want to assess the distribution, life history and diet of these species <clears throat> uh, of three small cryptobenthic gobies of the genus Trimmer. And the study is taking place in Kimi Bay in um, Papua New Guinea. And this is located in the Coral Triangle, which is actually a region uh, extremely highly diverse. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, they're known for their diversity of reef fish. 
So I chose these three species, Trimmer benjamini, Trimmer capostratum, and Trimmer yanoi, because they're highly abundant in Kimby Bay. And this is according to a 10-year data set by Philip Monday. So to assess their spatial distribution, I'm going to assess three shore locations, so inshore, midshore, and offshore. And Kimby Bay is actually characterized by these three locations. So the reefs in Kimby Bay, uh, there's a series that run really close to the shoreline, uh, and then some that uh, are far from any sort of land, and the ones in between, which are the midshore range. So uh, I want to see the distribution between these three locations. And the reefs in Kimby Bay often have a reef slope and really sheer vertical walls. So I would like to see the distribution uh, between these two areas. And lastly, for their depth, I'm going to assess three different depths. So four meters, six meters, and 10 meters. And this will be done by a series of belt transects. And we're gonna do 162 transects. And, um, with each individual that I encountered, I'm going to, I recorded the microhabitat aspects and I define this as the area one meter squared around the subject fish. So really zoning in on that fine scale microhabitat. And this was either vertical, horizontal, sloping inwards, sloping outwards, or an overhanging reef structure. And then I'm asking the question, does the microhabitat aspect differ between species? So yeah, really exploring that fine scale microhabitat partitioning and seeing if aspect is actually a defining factor. So here's just a quick res uh, summary of the results I've obtained from the depth distribution. And I haven't actually analyzed the statistical significance of these results yet, but it does appear that there's a different level of selectivity between the three species. So we're seeing the trimmer noi that's kind of highly selective there they're preferring uh, far mostly abundant at the 10 meters versus the four meters. And on the contrary, the trimmer capostriatum in the orange doesn't appear to differ um, over the different depths. And the middle ground would be trimmer benjamini where they appear to be moderately selective. However, there does appear to be quite a lot of overlap between the, the three species. And this makes me think that they are actually partitioning the microhabitat on a finer scale. So here's a quick summary of the um, microhabitat aspect results. And again, I haven't analyzed the significance of these results, but just from visually looking at this graph, where we have microhabitat aspect on the X axis and <clears throat> the mean number of individuals on the Y axis, uh, we're seeing the trimmer benjamini uh, found in higher abundance on the sloping outwards vertical and sloping inward section. Whereas the trimmer yanoi is actually found more abundant in the overhang and sloping inward section. And the capostratum also in the uh, overhanging reef structure section. Uh, so that's just a quick um, summary of the results that I've obtained so far. And now I'm just gonna talk about their life history, specifically their longevity, but also their pelagic larval duration, post-settlement lifespan, growth and sex allocation. And by understanding these, we hope that we can understand how their populations are actually functioning. And again, we're going to ask this question, do these factors differ between species? Uh, and we can provide possible reasons why. So how are we actually going to determine how old they are? I mean, we can't really ask them how their age, because that's quite rude. Um, so we can actually use their ear stones, their otoliths, to count how old they are. And in gobies, a new ring is deposited daily. So you can count their age like you would counting the age rings of a tree. And this study, uh, this otolith is actually of a trimonasa. And in this study, uh, there was a maximum age of 87 days. And that is incredibly short. And from the settlement mark, we can actually determine their post-settlement lifespan. So this is the time available that they have to do everything they want in their life after they settle from a pelagic larvae. And this was actually 47 days, which is incredibly short. Imagine only having 47 days to do everything you want in your life. So their short lifespan is actually, could actually be reflected in uh, uh, the histology of their gonads. So in the, um, the, they have two phases. So most, uh, the male phase, most of the individuals had mature testicular tissue and regressed ovarian tissue. 
Or it was the opposite in the female phase, with, phase where they had the mature ovaries, but the regressed testicular region. And we think that this could be um, necessary for rapid sex change. So they don't have to reconstruct their gonads every time they want to change sex. They can just switch back and forwards with ease so they don't have to reconstruct everything. And this could actually be a necessity with their short lifespan. However, some individuals we found actually had both male and female tissues present. So <clears throat> mature tissues present, sorry. Uh, so they actually had mature ovarian tissue and also mature testicular tissue at the same time. And they could actually be functioning as both sexes at the same time. And this just could be um, because it could actually just be easier to function as both instead of changing all the time. <clears throat> so in summary, so this potential explanations for the extreme diversity in this genus. And we also gain um, an understanding of their ecological roles. And this could actually help inform future management, which is really important with the current climate crisis and the degradation of coral reefs. And really, we just want to fill in this a little gap of the unknown, the unknown section of the jigsaw puzzle. So lastly, I just want to say, don't forget the forgotten fishes, because they could actually be more important than you think. So thank you everyone for listening and um, yeah, does anyone have any questions?